What is the creepiest missing person case you know about? This case isn't creepy as in Twilight Zone theme plays, but in that she had a good family, she was a good kid, everything should have been fine, and without risk and this girl still vanished February 14th, 2000. Asha Degree is 9 years old. It is not only Valentine's Day, but her parents' wedding anniversary, and Asha is missing point adults in her life sheltered her, to a fault. There was no computer or internet in the home. No cell phone. Asha's friends were from church or school. No one she interacted with was an unknown. A stranger would have had no access to her. She was either at church with family, school, at a relative's home, or her own home with her parents and brother I say this to illustrate that even in the early days of chat rooms and messaging, Asha would not have been using these things to meet someone online. Anyone unfamiliar in her life should have been quickly spotted point. But what we know is that the night of February 13th to 14th, Asha crept out of bed, dressed, and brought a packed backpack with her as she went into the night. But for what? Asha was afraid of storms and dogs, yet that night was pouring. Cold rain and she was alone with no one to cling to as she usually would when walking past yards with dogs. She was an obedient child who did not break rules. At 2.30am, her father is awake and checks on his children. They are both in bed, safe 3.15am. Drivers on Highway 18 think they see a little girl walking in the rain, over a mile from the degree home. When one driver circles around to check if the child needs help, the child runs off the road into the woods. If this was Asha, it is the last time she is seen alive. Has she managed to walk over a mile in such short time, in driving rain at night all by herself? Or was there a car, waiting for her outside her house? Did she willingly climb in? Was she let out, or did she escape? Candy wrappers, markers, and a hair bow are discovered in a shed back in the woods the child ran into. They belonged to Asha Point a year later. During construction, her backpack is discovered buried in the ground wrapped in several plastic bags. There has been no more clues as to what happened to this little girl point a popular theory is somehow she was lured out. Someone told her maybe it's a surprise party for her parents anniversary. We know she packed family photos and a change of clothes, one outfit being somewhat dressy. Asher is a good kid who doesn't tell lies. She had to be convinced this was a good secret to keep. One that her parents will be happy she kept, and she won't be scolded for sneaking out and breaking rules. This person would have to know her family, and not stick out a strange when talking to her. But why is she walking along the road? Did she escape this person only to be recaptured? Another theory centers around the book she read in school, The Whipping Boy. In the book, the characters run away and have an adventure. But remember, Asher is scared of the dark, storms, dogs. Why would she have a fun adventure on such a night? Why would she break so many rules along the way? It's out of character for her. This case, it just shouldn't have happened. The facts are simply bizarre and what we know just doesn't seem to fit. The police ruled out her parents, but could they know more? With no access to internet, who could have manipulated a shy obedient girl to fight against all her deep fears and vanish? One of the most chilling ones is Nathaniel Barjona. He was a convicted pedophile and suspected serial killer slash cannibal. He frequently impersonated police officers and attempted to lure children away from their homes. He was eventually arrested, but a judge ruled that the state had failed to prove that Barjona posed a public threat, so he was released, despite having told psychiatrists that he had a fascination of cannibalism. Not long after his release, a 10-year-old boy was reported missing. Witnesses claimed that they had seen him in an alleyway, waiting for somebody. Another witness saw him being followed by an obese man matching Barjona's description, and the boy was distressed. The boy disappeared somewhere in that alleyway and was never seen again point when the police searched Barjona's apartment, they found a list of names. The list included the names of his previous victims, as well as the missing boy followed by died. They also found newspaper clippings regarding the case all over his apartment. A former flatmate of Barjona's reportedly found clothes in the apartment which matched the ones the missing boy was wearing on the day he went missing point a notebook was also discovered with coded writing. It took months for the police and FBI to crack the code, but eventually they managed it. Barjona had written in-depth descriptions of cannibalism, as well as cooking recipes involving the body parts of children. 
The recipe titles included Little Boy Pot Pie and Roasted Child Apostrophe despite weighing over 300 pounds and known to have a large appetite. Police found that he had not made any significant food purchases for almost a month after the missing boy's disappearance. During this time, he frequently held barbecues for his neighbors, who mentioned frequently that the meat he was serving tasted strange. Police later found a meat grinder in his apartment, which contained human DNA. Point the police were never able to connect it by Jonah to the missing boy, and they never found the identity of the DNA from the meat grinder edit. Due to the amount of people who've expressed interest, I'm including some extra details slash clarification. The authorities in Montana, where the kidnapping occurred, weren't aware of his previous convictions which took place in Massachusetts. He had divulged some of his crimes to his probation officer, so the probation officer made a request to have his records sent through, but the records were never actually sent. Point cannibalism. He'd shown cannibalistic tendencies from the age of six. Teachers would frequently call his mother to notify her that Barjona was upsetting staff and students by eating his scabs and sucking his own blood. Whilst in prison, guards also observed this, as well as reporting that he appeared to be achieving sexual pleasure from it. Point lack of grocery purchases. He had purchased small items of food, ingredients for baking, for instance, but no meat or substantial food. Early kidnappings slash assaults. It's probably worth mentioning that Barjona began this attempted killing spree when he was seven years old. He lured a five-year-old girl into his basement, attempted to strangle her, but was stopped by the girl's mother when she heard the screams. When he was 13, he tried the same thing with a six-year-old boy, sexually assaulting him. He tried it once again a few years later with two boys, intending to kill them, but the boys wouldn't follow him. His next documented assault and attempted murder occurred when he was 18 and was believed to be the first time he impersonated a law official in order to assault a child. The child was found in the car with Barjona, covered in blood and his own excrement, nearly dead. He impersonated law officials several times in his life and was eventually, at age 20, arrested and charged with attempted murder, receiving the maximum sentence. Arrest and imprisonment. During his time in prison, he changed his name from David Paul Brown to Nathaniel Benjamin Levy Barjona, so that he could understand what it was like to be subjected to anti-Semitism. He acknowledged this in an interview with Dr. Michael Stone for Most Evil. It was in this year that the judge ruled that the state had not provided enough evidence to prove that Barjona was still dangerous, leading to his release. Sitting on a young child, a month after his release from prison, aged 34 and already morbidly obese, Barjona saw a 7-year-old boy sitting in a car alone. He entered the car and sat on the boy until witnesses and the boy's mother saw what was happening and and ran over, prompting Barjona to flee the car. A police officer recognized the witness description as Barjona and arrested him. Barjona first claimed that he had been attempting to get out of the rain, but later admitted that he had been trying to kill the boy. He was sentenced to probation points at Ramsey's disappearance. Police made the arrest when Barjona was found near a school, dressed as a law official and carrying a stun gun and pepper spray. Point Barjona was supposed to be tried for the murder and cannibalism of Zach Ramsey, but the child's mother would not cooperative with police, believing that her son was still alive. It is believed that Barjona may have first attempted to run the boy over in his car, as witnesses describe seeing a white car come close to hitting the boy. It was later confirmed that Barjona had access to his mother's car, which matched the description of the vehicle point at around the same time as the boy's disappearance. Barjona had been seen standing by a dumpster slash skip wearing a police uniform, matching the pattern of police impersonation from his previous kidnappings in the same alleyway. Whilst conducting the investigations into Zach Ramsey's disappearance, the detectives also found the word Tita in Barjona's garage. This is assumed to have been a misspelling of Tita, the surname of another boy who had been kidnapped 13 years prior. Barjona would have been 16. The boy had later been found dead, having been strangled and sexually assaulted. Huge lists of names were found written down. It is suggested that this may have been a list of his victims after all of this. Barjona was eventually arrested for impersonation of a law official. However, after detectives found pictures of children and a bone belonging to a boy, he was charged with kidnapping and sexual assault. He was also charged with torture. 
Many of his crimes occurred after the statute of limitations had expired. Dennis Martin June 14, 1969. Dennis was playing hide and seek with some other children while his father watched. Dennis went behind a tree, which his father never took his eyes off of. When the other kids came out, his father went over to find him, and we have simply gone point things get bizarre with this one point a nearly 1500 strong search is dispatched, a family named Key's testimony of possibly seeing Dennis is thrown away for seemingly no reason. The FBI withholds information about the unfolding case from the parents, the Green Barretts arrived to search, but no one called them. They are not in the official report of the case, the FBI agent working the case, and others like it, eventually commits suicide. Point the key family's testimony is that they heard a blood curdling scream. At first thought they saw a bear on a ridge across from them, but the father says as they watch, it is clear it's more like a man who is intentionally hiding from them. This large hairy man has an object slung over its shoulder and carries it away. They heard Dennis was missing after they left the park and returned to tell the story. The FBI agent doesn't want to see where any of this happened. Without even considering the information slash location, he says it's not possible for Dennis to have gotten that far on his own. It is well within the distance a child of his age could have traveled. Disappearance of Mark Kilroy in 1989. I was 19 years old, lived in Austin, TX. I was in College Street the University of Texas. It was spring break and a large group of us went to South Padre Island for a week. You would basically spend the day at the beach but at night, everyone would drive to Brownsville, park your car, and walk across the border into Mexico. The drinking age was lower and the booze was cheap. The town we went to was Matamoros. My friend and I drank a lot and then made the walk back to our car in Brownsville. When we got back to Austin, it was all over the news that another kid who also went to University of TX was missing. He had gone to Matamoros with two friends, they got separated in the crowd and could not find him. A few months later, his body was found in some creepy ranch in Mexico. He had been decapitated, legs cut off and some of his internal organs put into a boiling pot. It turned out some dude who was into Centuria abducted him and killed him as a human sacrifice to give him powers, to protect the drug cartels from getting caught by police. They believed this guy had special powers, so they would pay him money to perform spells to keep them safe. He claimed to get his powers from human sacrifice. You can't make this sheet up. Google Mark Kilroy, Austin, TX and you will find the whole story. It haunts me to this day that my friend and I were probably drinking at one of the same bars as him on the night he was abducted. We were two 19 year old girls, drunk, walking around Mexico at night. No cell phones back then. We never told our parents we went to Mexico. They thought we stayed at South Padre Island the whole time. <laughs> Creepy and simply unsolved. Had a rumored in college that I met a week prior to moving and threw a posting on one of the school boards. We met each other's families and they helped move us in. We rented one side of a twin house with some stairs. So the help was needed for the bedroom furniture. We had our own bedrooms, and we were the odd couple. She had a messy room with clothes, books, etc. everywhere, and I was simple. About a month in, she started complaining about having a tough time sleeping. Something was keeping her up, and she had a few weird bruises and scraps on her back. We didn't know where they came from. She didn't have a boyfriend or anything. We were both nerds, and studied or watched movies. No sports. Then one night, I came home from the library around 11pm. My roommate was home watching a movie. I said goodnight and went to bed. Woke up at 7am for class. Walked by her room and her door was open. As I walked by I looked into her room as I walked by. Her entire room was empty. She was gone. No note. I called the cops and they didn't believe me that I had a roommate and left. Even after showing the cops her parents checks then send for aunt. I called her cell, disconnected, called her parents, disconnected, asked around campus, no record of her. To this day I have no idea how she moved all her stuff out between 11pm and 7am without me hearing anything and waking up, I'm a light sleeper, and as of 11pm no one was in the house to help her. To this day I can't explain it, hence, it's the creepiest thing that has ever happened in my life. I moved out a week later. 
TL. Doctor moved into house with room that I hardly knew. Everything seemed okay. She couldn't sleep. Weird bruises and scrapes appeared. Rumor disappeared. In Michigan I worked at a quality diary and there was this family that came in every day. A mom and dad and some foster kids. A few years later the son came up missing. Mom and dad in the whole town spent days looking for him. Weeks. No leads. Nothing. Until it finally came out that the mom and dad knew where he was. In a garbage bag in a ditch on the side of the road. After questioning and all that comes with knowing where your dead child is, it came out that the mom hit him in the head with a hammer, killing him. Dad helped hide it. Little boy was 7 to 8 years old. Another, my cousin was kidnapped by his mother's boyfriend, not his dad, when he was 3. There were some mental issues with the mom's boyfriend. The town searched and searched and couldn't find him. They pulled the boyfriend into the police station for questioning. Meanwhile outside a police officer hears an odd noise coming from a parked car. The boyfriend's car. He breaks into the trunk to find my cousin wrapped up in trash bags, alive, wearing nothing but a soiled diaper. It was winter in Michigan. Lastly, my uncle had a baby with his girlfriend. At three months old they left her with her uncle, the mom's brother, so they could go out. They get home and discover what looks like a break-in. They wake the brother and he doesn't seem to know what is going on. Police get called. For three days they search and question everyone. Finally the brother caves. He killed the baby, wrapped her in grocery bags, walked around town and eventually buried her under the wood chips in the neighbor's backyard. Autopsy shows she was also molested. The most unsettling thing to me about this is that while everyone was searching, my grandma stopped more than once and looked at that pile of wood chips because she felt something. But no one ever checked under it. It didn't look disturbed. This case is the most remarkable disappearance I've ever read about slash followed. And definitely the one that plays on my mind. And every time I see his photo in the paper it hurts my heart. Point there have been so many twists and turns. The circumstances of his abduction were hard to understand. No one knew he was there at his grandma's house with family home in a quiet dead end street. He and his sister were playing hide and seek. They couldn't find him and began to worry point a year or so later a man's house was searched and sewerage system drained. Business searched. Same day, DHS with absolutely no knowledge of what's going on with the police, come to his house and take his grandchildren from his care. Privacy laws prevent the public from knowing point then he was charged with two counts of rape from 30 or so years ago when he raped two very young girls. It came out there was a bidophile ring operating in the area under the disguise of a support group for grandparents who are raising their grandchildren. All members were raising their grandchildren, but they actually got together to talk about their stories of sexually assaulting young children. One of these men even said to the media he didn't do it because he's only raped one child, as if just one was okay. Bill Spedding, the man whose house was searched and charged with historical such offenses was a part of that group. As was another man, Tony someone, who's been in and out of jail for child sex offenses. Was on bail when William went missing point then it came up that the grandmother had called a handyman to fix her washing machine a couple of days before William and his family arrived. He was to come and fix it on Friday. The nana mentioned she needed it working as her young grandkids were coming. Friday comes and just before William is snatched this man calls and says he can't make it to fix the washing machine. This man was none other than Bill Spedding. It was proven he was with the pedophile Tony that day. They were former neighbors known each other for years. A car similar to the one Tony owned was seen in the street with the front window half down just opposite the house William was at. Search and rescue went for days William's family have never been allowed to be identified for a reason only police know. Police have said they are not suspects in any way point there's too many twists and turns. To write it's easier to google it. Just writing about it makes me so effing angry. He was three for Christ's sakes and the horror he must have endured is too much to even imagine. It causes me pain and I have never met this boy in my life. My heart breaks for his family point the circumstances were one in a million and there have been so many things that have just made the story even more extraordinary. It's like a horror movie point. If I was granted one question that I could ask about anything and be given the correct answer, it would be what the hell happened to William Turrell. Fly high buddy. 
I used to work for an eye bank where we would harvest eye tissue for surgical transplant in Lubbock, Texas. This was about 13 years ago, and although I cannot remember the names and cannot find the details on the net anymore, I swear the following really happened point every once in a while. We would field calls for loved ones looking for some information about their loved ones organs or the donor slash recipient information. We never gave any of this info out unless a number of protocols were met, and despite my schooling and technical skill, this is a large part of the job. Working with cadavers and folks who had just lost loved ones made the job as eerie as you might imagine. Point one day I got a call that was stranger than usual. A woman called and asked if we keep records of the tissue that is donated. I replied that we do, and that our records were spot checked and verified by the FDA on an annual basis. She then asked if we have any record of a donor named, I can't remember the exact name, so let's call her. Mary Smith. I told her I couldn't give her that info unless she was to come to the office and deliver some evidence that she was related to manuscript. She proceeded to lower her voice and tell me, if you have anything to do with this, you're going down like the rest of them. Whoa. What the fuck? After that phone call, I reported the incident to my boss and my executive director. They got in touch with legal and I was instructed to, if I ever heard from her again, not say a word and hang up. My boss also intimated that legal had answered questions about this woman before point I was spooked and intrigued. I googled the woman's name and stepped right into an X-Files story. I don't remember every detail, but the cliff's notes read as such. The woman's mother had suffered some fate that landed her in the hospital. At a certain point, the doctors pronounced her deceased and she was sent to the funeral home. The funeral home put a body in the mother's casket. The daughter was absolutely adamant that the body in the casket was not her mother, but the body was eventually buried over her objection somehow. I remember that I read she kept petitioning the city to exhume the body to run tests, but she was shot down at every turn, which just confirmed to her that the body was not her mother. I eventually stumbled onto a pretty detailed website that she set up. It was something like isthasright.com, where she detailed a mountain of evidence some of it pretty convincing, and laid out her theory that the hospital switched the body, the mother was still alive, and she had been collected by a government entity so that they could experiment on her with radiation. The website was so detailed and so convincing that I couldn't automatically dismiss her claims. I don't know what happened to that lady or her mother. The fact that I can't find any info kinda makes me think the daughter passed away. But I still think about that phone call sometimes. That woman called up accusing the hospital, the funeral home, the organ donation firm and us. She also called and harassed the head of the Will Body Donor Program. All because she was sure the body in the casket wasn't her mom point I hope. That lady found peace. But I suspect she didn't slash hasn't. I worked in a 911 call center for a while. I wasn't an operator, but I worked with them every day. Anyway at lunch one day, an operator makes a reference to a call and everyone gets a little quiet. They notice I'm out of the loop and explain that many call centers have a collection of their calls that are just creepy, unexplainable, extraordinarily horrible, or famous in some way. Point one of these calls involved a guy on the phone that had been fishing in our local reservoir before the sun came up, like 5.30ish, and had seen something faked up in the water and it freaked him out. It was hard to hear what he was saying because he was running the engine full throttle and he was absolutely faking terrified. There is a specific quality in a terrified person's voice and even over the phone or through a recording you get chills up your spine and the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. He did not sound like a drug user having a bad trip. This dude was so faking terrified and then bam the phone hit the deck of the boat violently and there was no more engine noise. The man screamed very clearly that it got the motor, then kept repeating oh god it got the motor, then he started praying for his family. The phone sounded like it disconnected underwater. At the time I was at the center, the man had been missing for more than 5 years. Many rainless years later, the reservoir had completely dried up and someone found his boat, and the motor was gone. Judging by the damage, the motor had been violently torn from the back of the boat. The best guess is that he had gotten spooked and ran full speed into a log or a submerged hill in the lake. There were boys on most of the hills, but they're hard to see at night. 
the resulting damage sunk his boat and he drowned. The problem is, the lake is fairly small, and has active trails all around it. There is almost no chance his body would have gone unnoticed. Not too creepy, but I suppose it's a good story. The night of August 13th, 2010, I said bye to my mother. I can't remember if I hugged her or not, but I assumed she knew I was going out partying, so I probably didn't out of guilt. The last time I ever saw my mom was at that moment. She was sitting there sorting mail. My father, who was her ex-husband, was asleep upstairs in the master bedroom. She had been sleeping in the guest bedroom for quite some time now. They were divorced, but still in the same house probably due to my mother's religious conviction. Anyways, supposedly, that night she was going to let my dad know that she was selling the house and he would need to start looking for new living arrangements I got a call from my father on Sunday the 15, asking if I was with her, but I told him I had been with friends all weekend. He told me he thought my mother and I had up and left to be away from him, like we had done in the past. I was a bit confused, but didn't think anything crazy. Me, being naive, called her and left her a message, but, obviously nothing came of it point I was back home on Monday, after partying all weekend and that's when the perspective of worry began to take effect, growing more and more intense as every moment passed. Things were very foggy and downright confusing as we filed missing persons report, UMM that same day I believe. My father and I didn't technically have any beef, but I was not very close to him, and always had a negative view of him, because of how he treated my mother. I mean, me and her were inseparable. I always told her, when I got married I would buy her a house and hire someone to do everything for her. She was my best friend, so I was not in a good state, being at home with my father, while she was missing. It was like a dream state, or that slightly bust feel you get when you drink a couple beers pretty quick. Only, I wasn't relaxed, euphoric, or even happy. I was a zombie going through the motions. Things were different after that Sunday, when the dust started to settle. Like part one of my life was over, and a new life would begin now. This event shattered my life and my mental being. A few days, maybe a week later her phone was found by a construction worker on the highway about 15 miles from my house. That's it. All of her belongings were in her room. Her car was in the driveway. Nothing of hers was missing, just her. Investigators suspect foul play. My father and I both went with homicide division at different times to do the whole first 48th thing, polygraph, sitting in a small room with what looked like hidden cameras or something, interviews with different officers at 3am, all of it. I was quickly taken off the suspect list, while my father remains the primary person of interest in the case. According to investigators he failed the polygraph test miserably. As days passed, the possibility of finding her alive diminished. A few weeks later, the case went cold. Now, we are waiting for a body to show up, but what are the odds of that happening after 7 years? The family fell apart. I don't speak to my father or any of my siblings who live in other parts of the country. Now I live in another city alone, monitoring my anxiety and depression through my therapist. I have just a few, or maybe a couple friends. But, then we could go on about whether or not they're actually friends. In August she'll be pronounced dead. I'm still extremely confused, but I think my father was involved. The January after her disappearance my uncle from my dad's side committed suicide. He always seemed to be the happiest of all six of my uncles. Maybe he knew something? He died apologizing for something as he bled out after jumping in front of a bus. Was it for committing suicide or for the death of my mother? Robin Murphy, Robin. Francis Murphy, a tall, slender, 17-year-old Lake Carmel resident, was last seen on April 9, 1995, a damp Palm Sunday evening, in the Carmel Plaza on Route 52. The 5-foot 9-inch girl weighed 140 pounds, had dyed her hair black, and liked to wear black clothes. Murphy, who lived about a mile from the plaza with her family in Lake Carmel, had driven to the center, also called the ShopRite Plaza to meet her boyfriend, who worked at a Burger King restaurant at the plaza. Matt Esposito, who was long ago eliminated as a suspect, told police he never saw Murphy that night. Police found Murphy's car park near the Burger King, which is now a bank. 
Four days later, they found her purse, wallet, and keys in a grassy area behind the plaza. One of the last people to see Murphy that night was Howard Gombert Jr. Gombert. Gombert told police he had spoken with Murphy at the plaza that night, but denied any wrongdoing. They never found her body. Never had anything that led to any answers. It was recently released that the primary suspect, Howard Gombert Jr. had her underwear in a suitcase when he was arrested five years later in an unrelated sexual assault case. Gombert is now serving 30 years in prison for sexually assaulting an 8-year-old girl in Connecticut five years after Murphy disappeared. He is also a key figure in the case of Josette Wright, a 12-year-old Putnam County girl whose skeletal remains were discovered in November 1995, nearly 14 months after she disappeared. This may not be as creepy as others, but I'll write it here anyway, plus G-O-O-D ending. This one's about the kids of a friend of my girlfriend's parents they went to Italy as a family, two parents two little girls, I like it was Rome, and they just had a good time visiting all the touristy stuff. But one day suddenly, while wandering around a crowded place, their kids just disappear. Chaos ensues, since the children were too small yet for cell phones, so if they got lost they couldn't call or anything. I'm not sure about the age anymore, but it was below 10. I think 7 or 9 or something like that. Italian police got involved, searched a few days, and told them there's nothing more they could do, so the father's plan was to go home to Germany and hire a detective or something like that, but when he got to Germany, wife still in Italy trying to find the kids, he found a letter in the mail, telling him they had his girls, and needed ransom money, with a picture of his girls attached. It was a huge sum, something like 500 point euros or more. But still below 1 mil, I guess because the kidnappers weren't stupid and knew where to draw the money line for non-millionaires. Luckily, even though no millionaire, the father was filthy rich, so he somehow set up a meeting after a few weeks of discussing with the police. Details are blurry, don't remember everything so well from when my girlfriend told me and gave them the huge money sum and actually got his girls back, they're adults now, so this was some years ago, but it's still creepy, knowing how yout kids can just get swooped away and those guys are still out there. A friend of mine went missing the summer between 7th and 8th grade. She was classified as a runaway as most minority kids are, and be on some flyers, posted on telephone poles and warm at walls, never broadcasted anywhere else point she was gone for 5 years until 2012, when she was found in Mexico set trafficking point I knew she had a rough life. But I never knew the extent, until they rescued her. She had a reputation in the school just at 11 years old point turns out her B.O. mother was pimping her out and she ran away with a friend that filled her head with promises of a new life away from all of that in Mexico point they got to Mexico and she was immediately sold. So imagine being 12 years old in a new country doing exactly what your mother forced you to point she became pregnant two or three times and they sold her first two and she still had her last when she was found and brought back. So kind of a happy ending. We are 21 years old now we still talk she's had another child and she's been doing pretty good point there's a link for verification point another not. So happy story is another high school friend of mine who went missing my junior year of high school point what makes it so creepy is that she was a home health aide and was at a client's house when she left out at night with no shoes, jacket or her purse, meaning she knew who she was going to see and vanished. No witnesses, no trail, no trace point they found her remains the four months later, and the case is still unsolved point it hurts a lot when I think of her, because she was sweet and funny. I just don't understand why anyone would hurt her my town isn't that big, so I could very easily know her killer, but never actually know, and that right there is what makes it beyond creepy point rip Taylor. The disappearance of Terra Calico point that Ldra Terra Calico, an 18 year old, vanished while on a bike ride along a New Mexico roadway in 1988. After a few days of searching the road, all that was found were some bike tracks and a clear cover to her Walkman. Four days later, and 20 miles away at a campground, the rest of her Walkman was found. Nothing much came for nine months. Lady exiting a grocery store some 1,500 miles away in Port St. Joe, Florida, 
found lying near her car, which is believed to be terror point where it gets new level creepy as fackers, that 20 years later when police chief David Barnes of Port St. Joe received two strange photos of a sandy haired young boy in the mail, one an original photo of the child and the other with black. Marker scribbled over his mouth to resemble tape. 14 the first was postmarked June 10th, the second August 10th, and both were mailed from Albuquerque with no accompanying note or return address. On August 12th, the Port St. Joe Star received another letter, showing the same boy with black marker scribbled over his mouth. The boy in these pictures has never been identified, and it is unknown whether it's the same child as the one in the Polaroid, found in June 1989. I can't find the source now, but I remember reading that her mom and dad had kept her room in order and always made sure to buy her birthday presents, which they kept in her room. Point this case goes on and on. More can be found. Missing 411 point forest will eat people and never give them back point. So many weird occurrences and cover up something is in the forests and every culture has been aware of it. Point there are accounts of children traveling 21 miles over mountain ranges at night during the winter. Accounts of people who get drawn to the forest and are lost for many days before being found. Saying they were somehow pulled by the forest into getting lost. Edit. Seriously this sheet is goddamn crazy. Bloodhounds picking up zero cent, which is highly unusual, kids being transported many many miles in incomprehensibly short time spans, many times feds will be called in, and will keep everything hush hush, one FBI director of a couple of these weird cases ended up killing himself, I imagine he was guilty for what he had to keep quit. Freak storms always developing after someone disappears in the woods, when bodies are found it's often in very strange circumstances. Seriously just watch a couple of the missing 411 cases videos on YouTube or read about them and then click the wiki links I posted. This stuff is definitely not new at all. The ancients have been aware of this for a long time. For example, nymphs. People have been speaking about forest spirits for all of human time and there are lots of countermeasures for abduction that have been developed. Bone charms, rituals, some other interesting things. People will be within a meter of someone, turn a corner, and won't be seen for 5 seconds, literally, and will be gone forever, with zero trace at all point oftentimes strange occurrences in the woods are accompanied by dead silence. Birds and animals will stop making noise, and this is when sheet gets weird. Oftentimes the people present will describe that they felt an intense primal fear people with guns can go missing. People with GPS locators can go missing. But no one has had a mysterious disappearance when they carried both a gun and a GPS point I think a lot of people going missing in the woods are either taken by a forest spirit spirit is an archaic term. I think there might be something scientifically explainable behind the stories of spirits slash forest spirits. Maybe some form of collective consciousness in nature. Perhaps some kind of EMF or something. I think it probably works like a computer killed by serial killer slash abducted by hell people. Hell people are real. Read the story of how forest rangers used to not carry firearms, but after one of them was attacked by a mountain person, the government started giving forest rangers guns. I love how the government practically confirmed their existence point government abduction point and, probably accounting for most cases, people just getting lost. This explanation definitely does not explain a lot of these cases, however here's a case of guy who was taken by a jungle and who was eventually saved by two shamans. There's also another case of a kid who went missing for a while and was later found. He described being taken by his grandmother into a cave full of robots. The kid later came to the conclusion that his grandmother was also a robot because there were sparks and light coming out of her head haha was found later and his real grandma was like what the fuck. For me, the Vicky Hamilton case is the creepiest. Not because it's the creepiest case ever, because some of these stories are far more awful and creepy, but because Vicky was a schoolgirl who vanished barely 5 miles away from where I'm from point she was on her way home from visiting her sister, but never made it. She was last seen eating chips in a bus stop. It caused the biggest missing person search ever seen in Scotland, and nobody could find her. All that was found was her purse, which was in a bus station point the reason her body was never found by Scottish police was that it was no longer in Scotland. After she was killed, her murderer wrapped her up in layers of plastic, 
put her in his car, and drove over 300 miles to the south of England where he buried her, either in his garden or beneath the house. Everyone held out hope that she'd just run away to London and that she was okay. But her father said that he knew she was definitely dead when her mother died two years after Vicky vanished, and Vicky never turned up for the funeral point eventually. Around 2007 a man was arrested for murdering a Polish student named Angelica Clark. He was in his 60s and the police decided to do a check on him. He lived in the same area where Vicky Hamilton was last seen. They pulled apart the house there and found nothing. Eventually the search was widened and English police began searching his house in Kent. They found Vicky. And they also found another girl, Dana McNichol, who had gone missing in August of the same year as Vicky Point their killer, Peter Tobin, has a long history of violence towards women. It would not surprise me in the least if he killed other women we are yet to find or connect to him. And to think that if he had never murdered Angelica, then Vicky and Dana would still be missing today, 26 years later. South Australia Point in 1973, Joan, 11, cursed, 4, met each other at a football match and went to the toilet together alone. People had seen them trying to coax two cats under a car with some unknown person with a hat and a jacket who was later seen walking out of the stadium with the two girls. He was carrying the 4-year-old under his arm while the 11-year-old was hitting him in the back saying they want to go back. Before the police even knew about the abduction, a man said the guy he shared a boarding house with came home on the same day with two girls, telling him that they were his granddaughters. They matched the same two girls that disappeared, and he said the guy loaded them into a white van. They are still missing point he had the little one under his right arm and the other one was ahead of him. He walked them around in a circle in front of us, four or five men, laughing and joking point he said the kids were his grandchildren, but when the older one went to speak he told her to shut up and not say anything point Mr. Mark Malone who was 33 at the time of the girl's disappearance, went to the kitchen area of the boarding house, where he said he watched the man drag the small girl to the back of his van that was parked in a laneway. He threw the little one in roughly and motioned to the bigger one to jump in, he said. He slammed the back door and then locked it. It's not the way you treat your grandchildren, mister. Mark Marlone said he was so concerned he returned to his room and did sketches of the girls. Scotty and the van point he said he rang police the next day when news broke of the possible abductions, when I saw the photos I knew for sure it was those girls that I'd seen. He said, but the police said they had hundreds of sightings and would get back to me. He claimed they never did. He said he rang police a week later and then again around the first anniversary of the abductions with the same result. He said he didn't pursue it further out of frustration. But he contacted the Sunday Mail this week after reading a story published in the paper last weekend, marking the 40th anniversary of the girl's mysterious disappearance. Point Mr. Mark Marlon said Scotty, he never knew his real name, did not return to the boarding house and he never saw him again. Point he described Scotty as being in his early 40s with a broad Scottish accent. He said he was about 165 centimeters, had grey receding hair and limped on his right side. This is only creepy to me because it involves people close to my parents. My dad told me this about one of his old friends, and since I don't remember either name I'll call them Jack and Bella. Point Jack was one of my dad's best friends and talked my dad into asking my mom out. They were all really close and my parents tried to set Jack up with my mom's sister right before this happened, but my aunt had to cancel at the last minute. Anyways, Jack and Bella dated on and off through high school, but broke up when he went off the college. He moved back after college for work, went to a bar with a friend, and ran into Bella. She was there with a group of friends, after ending things with a mildly abusive whatever that means, guy. Jack and his friend joined Bella and her friends. Bella invited Jack to come back to her place, but he declined according to those in their group. She eventually left, and about half an hour later he and his friend left as well. Now, Bella had gotten a ride with a friend, so she was supposed to be getting a cab. Security cameras show her leaving and walking towards the street. When Jack and his friend left, cameras show them walking to their cars, Jack stopping and looking around, then continuing to his car. He then drives around back, no cameras there, back of bar faces woods. After 15 to 20 minutes, Jack comes running back into the bar, 
covered in blood, holding a penknife, screaming for help. His backseat is covered in Bella's blood. No body is ever found. Jack's story is as he was walking to his car, thought he heard someone scream, decided it was nothing, got in his car, then heard it again, and went around back to investigate. He followed the screams into the woods where he found someone stabbing Bella. He claims to have gotten the knife from the guy, chased him away, then moved Bella to his car to wait for help. He then ran into the bar. No evidence was ever found of a second person. Jack was arrested, charged in the disappearance, but found not guilty. Point there are two theories floating around. The first is Jack killed Bella. The second is that Bella's ex killed her. He was originally ignored because his car and credit card put him a few hours away, but a few security cameras around town put him nearby. So who was using his car and card? And why? However, it's also odd that no one else claims to have heard the screams Jack heard. It all just seems weird. This is probably gonna get buried, but I'm surprised nobody commented with Nicholas Barclay 13 year old Nicholas Barclay was playing basketball with friends on June 13th, 1994. His mom was asleep, so Nicholas called his brother, Jason for a ride home. His brother said no, and they hung up. Nicholas was never seen again, until, supposedly, three years later, from Spain, where he had been found. Phoned home for a ride in his San Antonio, Texas neighborhood, his older brother refused to help him. He would disappear following the call, never to be seen again. Police said he ran away because he had in the past and had a criminal record. Point three months after he disappeared, Jason claimed he saw his younger brother attempting to break into the family garage. The police showed up, searched the area, and said Jason had been lying. Three years after that, in October, 1997, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in Virginia received a call from a person in Linares, Spain, saying that an American boy showed up in a youth shelter claiming he escaped a set trafficking ring. He was declared to be Nicholas Barclay. Point Nicholas' sister, Carrie, flew to Spain, said this boy was her brother, gave him a passport, and brought him home to Texas. However, while Nicholas had had blonde hair and blue eyes, this new boy had brown hair, brown eyes, and a French accent. The boy said his kidnappers put chemicals in his hair and eyes to change it, and that the accent was from being in Europe for three years, and the family believed him. Here's where it gets really weird point the family didn't like the media attention, but Nicholas did, and kept contacting people in news organizations to speak with. A private investigator noticed during one of the interviews that Nicholas's ears looked different than they had as a boy and realized this was not Nicholas or a child. It was a 23-year-old man named Frederick Borden who was notorious for impersonating other people. When his identity was revealed, Frederick said he was actually relieved because the family had been feeding him information to make him seem more like Nicholas, and Frederick believed the family was responsible for Nicholas' disappearance and death. He even went as far to state that Jason knew he wasn't Nicholas because Jason had been the one to kill Nicholas. Jason was questioned and found dead only days later from a cocaine overdose. Frederick Borden went to prison. Nicholas was never found. Point nobody knows what happened to the real Nicholas Barclay to this day. They made a documentary about it, called The Imposter. It's on Netflix. I highly recommend it. The creepiest disappearance that I know of is Ray Gricker. Ray Gricker was a district attorney of Pennsylvania who vanished in April 2005. He told his girlfriend he was going for a drive. He failed to return home and his girlfriend reported him missing. His car was found in a parking lot at an antiques store and contained his phone. County issued, not his personal, but not his laptop. Wallet, key cigarette butts were found in the car, but Ray was not a smoker. He disliked cigarette smoke and wouldn't permit it or anyone in his car to do it. It's also worth noting that he was investigating the Penn State abuse scandal involving Jerry Sandusky at the time and built a sturdy case against him. The puzzling aspect of this is seven years before his disappearance, Ray mysteriously refused to press charges despite having stacked up enough evidence against Sandusky. 
Three months after he disappeared, fishermen find a laptop and turn it over to the FBI. The hard drive was missing two months later. The hard drive is found, but cannot be salvaged. Point four years after Ray disappeared, someone used the home computer of Gricker's residence and conducted a search on how to wreck a hard drive, how to fry a hard drive. It's also worth noting that Ray had a brother who went missing and was found dead in 1996. The location where the two went missing, albeit with Ray's brother being found, is somewhat eerie. Point Ray Gricker was declared dead in absentia in 2011. Point what I find to be the creepiest part of this is, going by my theory, Ray was planning to blow the case wide open and reveal others involved in the scandal, but before he could so, he was silenced. The murder of Terry, Missy, Bevers. Here in a small Texas town, a woman was brutally bludgeoned in a church while prepping to coach an exercise program. She originally planned to hold the event outside, but was interrupted by a storm. The day before her murder, she posted on her Facebook that the event was being moved inside of the church at around 5am, I believe. The creepy part? There is footage of the killer completely dressed in SWAT uniform wandering with a very peculiar limp around the church. He slash she opens many doors and breaks a few things with a hammer while waiting on Missy to arrive. There also exists footage of a car circling the building a couple of times that is thought to be the killer. They couldn't grab a full plate due to pixelation, but know the make and model of the car. Missy apparently had inappropriate conversations on LinkedIn with another fitness instructor. Her marriage was known to be troubled due to finances. Her husband was out of town for work and supposedly returned that afternoon. Her father-in-law actually resembles the murderer in terms of stature and limp. Police found that he was out of town and returned to the news of his daughter-in-law being murdered. Police found bloody clothes that the father-in-law dropped off at the dry cleaners, but the blood was from his wounded dog. Point despite seeing the killer for several minutes on tape, there have been no arrests or suspects. The husband and father-in-law are cleared. I interviewed a paranormal investigator a while back for a project I was doing. The guy takes his job seriously and is no on the circuit and has appeared on multiple paranormal TV programs. When asked what's one of the strangest cases he has worked on, he told me that it was a missing person case. In short young couple with one child, one day the husband comes home from work, has some dinner then proceeds to go upstairs to get ready to go out to meet his friends that evening. His wife is downstairs and hears a thud from upstairs. Thinking it's her husband dropping something etc. Point. While getting ready she carries on doing the housework. After realizing her husband has still not come downstairs she goes to look for him, unsuccessfully. After two days she is able to call and log with the police a missing person. Fast forward three weeks and again she hears a thud. She goes to investigate and finds her husband in their bedroom getting ready. After questioning her husband where he'd been etc, he replied he hadn't gone anywhere and was getting ready to go out before his wife explained what happened. Fast forward again two months, husband is upstairs getting ready for work his wife is downstairs making breakfast, his wife has never seen him since. I was told the police brought in the paranormal investigator as they were stumped. The missing husband's wife is too scared to sell slash move house as she hopes her husband will reappear one day. I've probably got a few details wrong as I'm trying to recall from memory but that's the gist of it. Okay so this isn't exactly what you want, but I feel like sharing. I used to go over to my friend's house to play often after school and really often during during Christmas and summer break, he had all the latest games and toys, so I couldn't resist. He lived like 4 or 5 streets over in a nice suburb. So I was walking home from my friend's house in the early afternoon during Christmas break. There was a man whose truck was stuck in the snowbank. I was walking at the other side of the road and he smiled and waved at me. I waved back and he asked if I could help him get his truck out of the snowbank. I was like 6 years old, maybe 7 years old at the time, sort of tall, but skinny as a rake. Basically useless for this sort of thing and I knew it. Also my parents drilled it into me to never talk to strangers. So that's what I said to him. He replied with please. I'm really stuck and I need help. And I said no again. He the said could you at least hop in and turn the key. Sorry mister I have to go home my mom is waiting for me. That's when it gets creepy. 
He had this angry look in his eyes and his smile just went to a flat line. I just said goodbye and started walking away, peeking over my shoulder. I really got scared when the man was watching me walk away with that same look. After I had gone a few hundred meters he turns, hops in the driver's side door, starts the truck, pulls the one wheel out of the snowbank easily, and drives away in the opposite direction. I told my parents right when I got home, and they walked me to my friends until we moved away 2-3 two to three years later. Does digital disappearance count? I made a friend in school several years ago. We spent about two years together and kept in touch before the both of us moved away in other countries. We used to play online video games together or simply chat point about five years ago. He moved closer to my country and we were finally in the same time zone, which made it easier to talk. Since I had trouble adjusting to a new country, he was one of my closest friends during that time. We used to call each other on Skype pretty much every night and again, we'd play games or chat point I remember my last message to him. It was on Skype, in late 2014. I've since lost the log after reinstalling Windows, but I sent him a message shortly before midnight to answer a question. It wasn't anything particular. The next day and ever since then, I've never been in contact with him again. He didn't have much of an online presence, but I've checked. He hasn't used anything, Skype, Steam, Facebook, since that time period. I sent messages on whatever platform I could, he's never even seen them. For this reason, I don't believe he simply ghosted me, because he hasn't logged on Steam since then either, and he had many games he used to play. Point I managed to find his sister and brother on Facebook and sent them a message, but due to the way unsolicited private messages work, I'm not sure they've ever been notified they had them. You know, at first I thought he had internet issues, he didn't even have a microwave, but I don't know if that was by choice or by budget, or that he was too busy with work, but it's been two and a half years, so yeah I'm not hoping for any news point sheet, I even emailed his town to see if they had more information about him, thankfully I know his full name at least. But all they could legally tell me is that they had no death certificate to his name, and that's if he died in the same town. Or if he even is dead. Two recent and close two home cases please read. If you are in the metro Detroit area. They could be so close to finding her. December 2, 2016. Danielle, 28, left work and was supposed to be meeting a friend for dinner. But never showed up. They found her car the next day. Covered in dirt. And parked outside her apartment with her purse inside. But cell phone gone. December 22nd. 2016, the home of a security guard who worked in her building, was searched and evidence collected. Police didn't give details on what they were looking for, but determined that Danielle was the victim of a crime June 27, 2017. Police arrested Floyd Galloway Jr., the security guard, in connection with an attempted rape of another young woman in a nearby park. July 19, 2017. Police searched the park for evidence of Danielle, but come up empty. They informed the public that, based on prior evidence, they do not expect Danielle to be found alive, but locals should be on the lookout for a brown comforter that is missing from her apartment, and she may be found in. July 20, 2017. Police searched Galloway's house again, and found it empty, with the exception of a home surveillance system. They moved on to a nearby house, where Galloway had been staying with his wife and her mother. The wife was not highly cooperative, but handed over items police had asked for. No longer missing, but terrifying since it involved the brother of a former classmate, and happened so close to home. Stephen, 18, left his house at around 2.30am on March 10, 2016. His parents said it wasn't unusual behavior for him to go out so late, and that he always kept in contact by phone. When he didn't come home, his parents reported him missing. The case went cold for a year, with no leads or updates. On April 26, 2017, a girl came into the sheriff's office and told investigators that her friend, Yvette McDonald, had confided in her that she had helped her boyfriend, Andrew Fiaco, dispose of Stephen's body in a rural part of the county, about 15 miles from Stephen's house. On April 27, 
Police searched the area in Fiaco's house and found remains at both places. Fiaco and McDonald had both been interviewed when Stephen first went missing, since Fiaco and Stephen had been friends since they were little, but denied knowing anything. McDonald eventually told police that Fiaco drove her out to the area and showed her the body, describing how he had shot and killed Stephen a month prior. They then left and returned a month later with an axe and cut his body in half. They put his lower half and head in a duffel bag and took them back to Fiaco's house, where they burned and buried it. Fiaco confessed to shooting Stephen three times, once in the stomach and then twice in the back, but police still haven't determined a clear motive. The preliminary exam is set for August 16th. Lisa Rye went 4 a.m., October 4, 2011. Ten-month-old Lisa was discovered to be missing from her bed by her father who had just returned home from work. The father told the police that multiple lights were on, a window was open, the front door was unlocked, and multiple cell phones were missing. Point in the coming days, a cadaver dog found the scent of a dead body near the mother's bed. Other than that, the only lead tag police had was two witnesses who claimed to have seen someone walking down the street with a baby the night of the disappearance. The police arrested and questioned a man fitting the description one witness gave, but the other said they were not the man they saw that night. Point the police claimed the parents were uncooperative during the investigation, but the parents claimed the police were accusing them of being involved in her disappearance. The mother said the police told her she failed a lie detector test and told her you did it, you did it, and we have nothing, the only developments were that in May of 2012 the parents debit card was used on a website where you can buy fake birth certificates, and in October of 2013 a girl of similar age and description was found in a Greek gypsy camp, but was determined to not be Lisa Point Sum, her parents included, believe she's living somewhere in a daily with parents she thinks are her own. Currently there's a ton of missing women in Ross County, Chillicothe, Ohio. Law enforcement suspect a serial killer, but can't prove it. The area is very rural, at times single lane dirt roads rural, and over an hour from any major city. Many of the women who went missing were recovering addicts and prostituted themselves for income, some are believed to have gone missing while waiting for clients in the same part of town. May 3rd. 2013, in Portsmouth, a town about an hour south, Megan Lancaster goes missing. She's the mother of a young child. Her vehicle was found abandoned at an area business. No trace of her has been found since. May 3rd, 2014, exactly one year later, Charlotte Trego goes missing in Chillicothe. She has children and it's not like her to leave without notifying family. May 3rd, 2014 Charlotte Trego, above, S friend, Tamika Lynch, is seen alive for the last time in Chillicothe. Lynch is found dead on May 24, 2014 by kayakers on a creek in a rural part of the county. Investigators learn she was dead when put into the creek and had odded on various drugs. Cause of death is ruled undetermined as it's impossible to verify if she took the drugs of her own will or was drugged. November 3rd. 2014, six months later, Wand Lemons disappears in Chillicothe. Her 19-year-old daughter says she disappeared into thin air. Lemons has four other children. No trace of her has been found, and she's not contacted any friends or family members, entirely out of character for her. Christmas Day, 2014, Shasta Helmrich, pregnant, goes missing. From article linked below, Himmelrich was last seen by her family on Christmas Day 2014. The following morning, her car was found abandoned near Higby Bridge in southeastern Ross County. Eight days later, searchers found Himmelrich's body in the Sayato River, about a mile south of Higby Bridge. May 11, 2015, six months after Lemon's disappearance, Tiffany Say goes missing in Chillicothe. She was prostituting herself at the Chillicothe Inn, left to meet a client, and never returned. Her cell phone was never powered on again, and she has never contacted friends or family. Was found murdered on June 20, 2015 by hikers in the Highland Nature Sanctuary, 25 miles from Chillicothe, October. 2015, Donnie Cochiner Jr. is charged with the murder of a woman found dead on his property, Timberly Claytor, but there is no proof he is responsible for the other missing slash dead women. 
Clay Tor went missing the 29th of May 2015. Summer, 2017. Several teenage girls go missing in June and July. Some are located, some are not. Some folks link the initial missing slash dead women to missing slash dead women in other parts of Ohio. Women who went missing and or were killed in three counties all attended the same rehab Andrew Morrison was convicted for his role in similar cases in another part of the state. A man who goes by dollar bill was convicted of other charges, but suspected of being responsible or contributing to these disappearances slash murders. Nobody has proved either man responsible. The disappearances of grown women have stopped, though teenage girls have started disappearing. None have been found dead yet. Thank you universe. Sending love and light to that community and to every community where it is terrifying to be female point article. There was a case this spring in the area where I grew up, N. California. A young female college student went missing after spending the evening with friends. For over a month, no one knew where she was or what had happened to her. Her friends refused to make any public statements, and the gossip on local Facebook pages about the missing girl was that an accident had occurred while she was drinking with her friends, and they'd gotten scared and hidden her body. Then, several days after she went missing, her truck was found halfway home in an orchard, and her cell phone was lying nearby. Then, weeks later, they found her body in the river that was within walking distance. The general idea of what happened is that she somehow got her truck stuck in the mud. The small town where she lived has a lot of back roads through farmland, and according to her friends she might have been slightly buzzed while driving, and therefore took the back road. Then, apparently, she'd exited the truck, gotten her phone out, and then dropped it, then somehow fell into the river. Unfortunately, there haven't been other details released. The official cause of death, after her body was identified with dental records, was ruled as drowning. But how exactly this happened will probably remain a mystery forever. I know that her family has suffered horribly, not knowing if she was alive or dead, sending out pleas to her to come back home. Just awful all around, regardless of whether she drowned in her friend's pool and they dumped her body, or if she was drunk driving and somehow stumbled into the river and died. This isn't creepy in the way most of them are but it disturbs me given how close I was to it. One of the women on my mother's side of the family, I believe she was my mom's cousin, if I remember correctly, went missing last year in North Carolina. She was last seen at the grocery store, and then no one had any clue where she was background. My immediate family had gone there when I was much younger to visit. I was about 13 to 14, and it was one hell of a creepy place. The whole family lived on a dirt road, kind of Texas chainsaw style, just a bunch of trailers side by side where each related family lived next to each other. At the end of the dirt road, there was a graveyard where people from that side of the family were buried. I don't believe in mystical stuff, but being plagued with a long history of very faked up events, that side of the family talks about their curses all the time. A lot of them have been murdered or died in very mysterious ways over the years. Anyways, my mom called me to tell me how panicked everyone was about her disappearance. The town has a population of 4000, so it is rare someone simply vanishes. They found her body a few days later in the woods near her home. She was in her 40s and a 15 year old boy had broken in, raped her, killed her and then dumped her body nearby. If that isn't faked up enough, my mom told me shortly after that, the kid was somehow tied into that side of the family, like the son of her brother's ex-wife or something. I will have to ask her to remind me the details of that part as I'm a bit hazy, but the whole thing was just really bizarre. The strange disappearance of Birgit Amis article is in German. I didn't find any English articles about her it has been two years, and still there are no clues. Like, at all. Nothing point she worked for an airport, as a meteorologist, with long working hours. After her shift finished, she would have rested a bit in a little rented flat at the airport, before driving the 170 kilometers home to her husband, having plans to do an Easter barbecue with him and her three grown children on the weekend. Another plan was to go on a hike with a friend, whom she texted Happy Easter on the day she disappeared. This text is the last message from her she never arrived home, and as of today, there are no traces, no clues as to what could have happened to her what is known about her, she didn't have any close friends where she worked, 
Her social life happened at home, but she had a social life with friends and family. Her car was found a few days later on a parking lot in the nearby village. No signs of struggle point she talked to her brother, who worked in the same place, a few hours before she disappeared. Normal conversation, nothing unusual point for all that we know, she was happily married, no signs of an affair point she didn't depart by plain, either legally or with forged papers. The only strange thing was that her cell phone setting was switched to flight mode, which must have apparently been done after her car was parked in the parking lot. I don't quite understand the article here, but the suggest that it meant that Amis must have returned to her car to switch it into flight mode or her murderer. This case happened in my hometown in India about 10 years ago. An only son of a wealthy Juwala family went missing. They didn't go to police immediately because he often used to not come home or call four days. When they finally lodged complaint it turned out that his best friend was also not seen for days. The call records showed that he was called by some girl to meet her and never written. As police investigated it appeared that the girl was related to some manner with A and soon it became clear that A has something to do with the abduction. However no ransom was demanded even after a week or more. Police searched for A and found him. What he confessed was disturbing. A was poor and this guy paid all his bills and stuff. A became jealous and greedy. He was a punk anyway. So he connived with a hardened criminal named Serap, Mean Snake, to kidnap his friend to extort ransom. They made this fake call by a girl and told him to come to meet her. When he came they abducted him. But when they abducted him this guy identified the voice of A and said you did this to me. Now his identity exposed he panicked. Serap told him to leave everything to him and go to hiding somewhere. And from there he was caught by police. There was no sign of the kidnapped guy or Serap. Days later Serap was killed by police in an encounter. People suspect it to be fake encounter that is shot despite surrender because of the public outrage against him. However, the police never found the body or any evidence of murder. The strange thing is, if the encounter was fake police certainly interrogated Serap to get the location of body and stuff. There is little doubt that Serap killed him. Escape theory was there, but this guy was very rich and there is no way he would not return home if alive. It ended very bad for the family his father, healthy till then, died of a heart attack shortly afterwards. Losing both son and husband his mother became delusional, she staunchly believed that he is alive, and being hit in the head, lost his memory so is not returning home. I first heard about this case as an LDS missionary in main point, after bringing boxes of evidence to the ag about fraud and money laundering point Rod's brother Tim has some mind boggling comments at the end of the news article, mystery, I don't think, so point on June 17th. 2005, upon their request, I submitted to an investigator for the main state police a document in which I outlined how. Over many years, I came to the conclusion that Rod Hottam is buried on land in Kingsbury Plantation. We were told that there was definitely enough information to warrant looking for Rod's body and this investigator indicated that he was familiar with the names presented by me and what they are capable of. On June 28th. 2005 I went to Kingsbury Plantation under the direction of the main state police and watched as they searched for my brother's body with a cadaver dog. After so many years it is hit or miss. The dog was unable to find Rod's body. Former Ag Michael Carpenter said I think he is dead and went on about some big big investigation into Indian money before he fully understood the gravity of the situation and decided car. In Nick Bryant's book The Franklin Scandal we gain an understanding of some of the ugly realities that Rod unwittingly stepped into point when they realized Rod was a man on integrity and could not be compromised corrupt forces within our government decided to indict a ham sandwich. If the information that I have been providing since Rod's disappearance was followed we would have ended this long ago and cleaned up some of the scum that is bringing this country down in the meantime. Rod wanted his day in court. Why do you think they waited until after he was gone to indict him? He had every intention to provide authorities with information to show his innocence in any allegations being tossed at him and what this was really all about. He was, after all, going to the chief law enforcement officer in the state when he was taken point the last night I stayed with Rod he slept on the top of the bed with all his clothes on and a loaded and pumped shotgun at his side. 
When I woke up the next morning he strongly encouraged me to leave. I wanted to stay, but he would have no part of that. As I look back I realize how naive I was, and that I didn't fully grasp the gravity of the situation. I believe Rod did, and he ran me off, because he didn't want his mother to lose two sons. Our eyes were locked as I pulled the door to roommate closed. In my mind's eye it seems like yesterday. When I think of that moment it's as if I were there. How could I have known that I would never see him again? Should I have pretended to go home and stayed to watch over him? Should I have flat out refused to leave? Could I have helped him? Would he be alive today if I would have made another choice? I didn't know I would never see him again. Point to Mahotam point also written in the comments of the article, written in 2011, linked by Tim. Rod was born on December 20th, 1953 which would make him 57 years old, if he were alive today not 66 years old as the article states. On December 20, 2007 Rod's mother was visited by Joshua P. Haynes from the Criminal Investigation Department Division 3 of the Maine State Police to take a DNA swab because they were investigating the murder of Rod Hotham point several days later when I spoke to Sergeant Troy Gardner of the main state police he explained to me that there was an open file and that they believe Rod could be dead and that he could have been murdered. He also explained to me that the reason for the DNA collection was because Rod was considered a missing person and that the state had to collect DNA for missing persons in order to qualify for federal money. Point can you imagine Rod's mother on Rod's birthday five days before Christmas answering the door for a state police officer who told her he went out of his way to visit her to collect a DNA sample because they are investigating the murder. Of your son, if you don't read the newspaper you are uninformed, if you do read the newspaper, you are misinformed. Mark Twain. Obligatory this isn't what you asked for, but I thought it was good enough to post point this is from the Knoxville area of Tennessee. A teenager named Elizabeth Thomas was abducted in March by a teacher named Tad Cummins. She left her house in the morning, video surveillance caught this, like she was going to school, but she met up with Tad. They were both later seen at a Walmart, caught on surveillance, a couple days later, and after that there were no confirmed sightings. The case went national at that point and hundreds of calls reporting sightings from around the country came in. I actually reported a sighting, but I have no idea if it was them. Point it should also be said that they were seen kissing by another student, and a no-contact order was issued in February. The morning before she disappeared she had told her sister, if I'm not home by 5, call the police. Her coworkers reported that she would hide from Tad whenever he came into her workplace. All around creepy point she was found in early May in Northern California, and she lost a lot of weight. She said there were times when they were eating flowers. She kept rocks from places she had been and wrote the location on them, which were confiscated by the FBI. Tad admitted to his wife that he did have sex with Elizabeth. Her parents had said some days she'd be happy and laughing and others she'd be inconsolable, and it's obvious she was severely affected by the kidnapping point that man took advantage of a vulnerable teenager to fill some sick fantasy. It pisses me off to this day. I'd have to say the Laura Bradbury case from October 18th, 1984. My family had just moved to San Diego around the same time, and it was big news, which is why I remember it. Laura Bradbury was a 3-1-2 year old girl camping W slash her family at Joshua Tree National Park. Laura followed her older brother to one of the portable restrooms, and when he came out she was gone. No one saw anything or heard anything, she just vanished. To this day there has been no trace of her, even though hundreds of people searched. I think I remember seeing Laura's face on a milk carton, remember that, I have children and grandchildren and the thought of having any of them just vanish into thin air is terrifying point I also have to throw in the Steven Stainer case, because I remember the sensation when he showed up back at his family's home in Merston 1980, after disappearing in 1972. At age 6. He was kidnapped and lived w slash a man named Kenneth Parnell. 200 miles away, who renamed the kid Dennis Parnell. In 1980 Kenneth abducted another boy, Timothy White, who died in 2010, who kept crying for his mother. Steve slash Dennis decided to leave and find Timmy's parents. They went to a police station in Ukiah and told everything, W slash Steve saying I know my first name is Steven. 
his family never gave up hope that he would come home. A made 40 V movie was came out in 1989 about his experiences, it received very high ratings, but the story ends tragically. Steve had a hard time adjusting to his new life, he ended up marrying and having two children, then he died in a motorcycle accident in the fall of 1989. His younger brother, Kari, killed four women in Yosemite in 1999 and is sitting on death row in California awaiting execution. This one hit pretty close to home which is why I remember it. Joshua Gimond. He would have graduated college with me. We even had a class together during the previous semester though I wasn't close with him. Point the story is he was on college campus and disappeared without a trace one night after leaving a party to go to the bathroom. I found while searching for links to post here. The Charlie project mostly tells the story, but I can add a few more details. Gimond was last seen between approximately 11 p.m. and midnight on November 9, 2002, leaving Metton Court, a dormitory on the north end of the St. John's University campus in Collegeville, Minnesota. He was a junior at the university at the time he disappeared, majoring in political science. Gimond left a party at Matten Court to go to the bathroom, and when he did not return within 15 minutes, his friends assumed he had walked back to his on-campus apartment at St. Moore House in the middle of campus. Gimond apparently never arrived there, however. His friends called his apartment shortly after they last saw him and assumed he was asleep when they got no answer. Point is a set of apartments on the lower part of campus where a lot of upperclassmen lived. They house three to four people per apartment. If you went to college, you might think it's strange that an upperclassman lived on campus, but most of us did. The the school is in a rural area and there aren't many options for off-campus housing. It wasn't uncommon for more partying to occur on lower campus. While the school does have faculty residents, monks that live in the same areas as students, there would only have been one for all of Metam Court and they tended to look the other way about partying especially on lower campus where the guys who lived there were of drinking age. Is on the upper part of campus. It's about three quarters of a mile between upper and lower campus. The walk to get from lower to upper campus is along a fairly. I had friends who lived in Metam Court that year and they most certainly had bathrooms in the units. So the fact that he stepped out to use the bathroom was a bit strange. Though I also wouldn't have thought twice if a friend of mine was at a party and said he was going to go piss outside. In fact, I'd probably have laughed about it thinking he might run into campus security and get in trouble. Point I also had lived on upper campus and attended lower campus parties before. That walk was nothing to think about. Everyone made that walk. Drunk too. It'd be like walking home from your neighborhood bar after a few drinks. You know the route well, and even if you were pretty inebriated, you'd be able to get yourself home. It's a little fuzzy on whether or not Josh was drinking that night. He was at a party, and the other students there did admit there was some drinking. But I believe they said Josh didn't have any or had very little that night. Point at the time there were some other people who had disappeared from college campuses in the region. There was a conspiracy about smiley faces being found at the scene of all of them, though I don't think that ever went beyond a rumor. The administration at St. John's and Josh's father are at odds. They prevented the cops from searching parts of campus and eventually barred the father altogether. I also learned a few things I wasn't aware of at the time while writing this up. Apparently some files were deleted from Josh's computer and he may have been part of a fake ID ring. Josh was also apparently writing a piece critical of some of the sexual abuse by clergy members on campus that had occurred. I also wanted to point out the sheriff's department leading the search was the same department that handled the Jacob Wetterling case. That case went on for 27 years and recently the local public radio station made a podcast about it and essentially made the sheriff's office out to be incompetent. The podcast is called In the Dark if you want to give it a listen. Kieran Horman. He was from my state. An hour away from where I lived. It was all over the news when he disappeared, and right from the moment the Amber Alert came up. Not as much creepy as disturbing. Maybe not people who didn't watch it go down on the news, and compared to other stories here is the wiki, but the Oregon Live has a moment by moment report on it. Point I will give you a report, so you don't have to go reading multiple news sources, but I'm going to put a disclaimer here, that I can be wrong on some info. 
This investigation has intrigued me so much I can help, but talk about it. Point Kiran's mom, Terry, is suspected to have either killing Kiran or hiring someone to do it. She took him to the science fair at school and left. Terry claims the last time she saw him was him walking to his first class, but he never showed up to his first class and never turned up after. A kid did see him that day, but he was out in front of the school. Later in investigation, they found what they believed to be the Hormans family truck leaving the school around the time they believed Kiran to be missing, and went to two different Fred Mears in the west side of the town. Terry never claimed to have went to Fred Mia that day, however. Terry said she drove around with Kiran's little sister to soothe her because she had an earache and then went to the gym. In the wiki article it states Terry tried to hire her landscaper to kill her husband. The landscaper reported this to the police. Terry's husband divorced her on the spot for more than one reason. One of the reasons was that he believed Terry killed Kiran because she constantly expressed her extreme hatred for Kiran. It was reported that Terry's mental health started to deteriorate in 2005 by family members and that it got worse before the incident. The husband constantly filed lawsuits because apparently Terry broke the restraining order and once tried to kidnap their daughter. The husband claimed in court. Terry apparently just lost her sheet and kept harassing him, but he started to take her to court with anything and everything she did that was aggressive towards him. His credibility went out the window because he has been relieving details way after the initial investigation, so it's hard to trust that anything he claimed Terry did or said before and after the incident. Why wouldn't you tell investigators of Terry's bad behavior a year into investigation? It seems a bit fishy point they kept going back to Sorvi Island even after the search party was called off a while ago and was reported to have searched the pond in the Hormans backyard. A year later another search took place west of Sorvi Island in the Skyline Drive and Dixie Mountain Road areas. The investigators had very specific reasons to be searching there. Sometime in the investigation they searched 2.2 miles around the home of Spitcher on northwest Old German Town Road Loop. Spitcher is Terra's friend who was seen hanging around her during the early investigation and became a suspect. Spitcher was gardening during the event. They've also interviewed regulars at the gym Terry went to. Terry is the biggest suspect to the investigation, but they never could have filed anything against her. Everyone believes it was her, and this has caused her to attempt to change her name multiple times and move point I always believed Terry had something to do with it, but I'm conflicted. It's because of the lack of charges and that they allowed her to move from Portland to Eugene and finally Sacramento. They also let her get jobs. They are constantly keeping tabs on Terry though, so they still suspect her of it. Point last report in May 2017. Investigators are constantly find new evidence and holding court hearings. Terry fled to California and was arrested for gun theft in 2016. They are hoping to try and find computer evidence to see if it will help the investigation. Point some details may have been left out, but I reported the highlights. It's way more than wiki provided. A dude named Jack Jimenez went missing right before I graduated. I was acquaintances with him and didn't dislike him, but a lot of people seemed not to as he was regarded as a petty thief and he seemed to be involved in drug dealing and such probably was in with and disliked by a ton of very unsavory people. Anyway, there's an area by me called Twin Ponds, which is basically a tributary to the nearby Forge River. Police allegedly found a head nearby, but no body shortly after Jack went missing. Rumors, of course, flew around that it was Jack's head. This is 1998, when the internet was still somewhat of a commodity so nobody could really research it, but looking his name up right now shows that his status is still missing, so it probably wasn't his head point in the mid slash late 2000s. I moved near Charlottesville, Virginia and got a job at the Uva print facility. Later in the day I picked up and dropped off various projects and ended up at the post office. During a Metallica concert at John Paul Jones Arena, the university stadium, a teenage girl named Morgan Harrington disappeared. Rumors were that she was picked up by a van full of dudes when she left the concert on a nearby overpass while walking around. For months, her family and local law enforcement were searching for her but found very little to go on. The following late summer, a local farmer found some strewn human bones and ripped clothing in his field, and they turned out to be hers. 
It was sad and creepy as hell. Every day I had to drive over that overpass and see all of the tribute, memorial, etc. point pictures and candles and such. It was depressing point for a rather unassuming area, there was a ton of other crazy stuff going on around that time a couple was watching the sun rise on a nearby mountain lookout area, and some dude just drove up and scattered them from behind with a shotgun. They both fell over the lookout the man died, but the girl was still alive and partially in shock, I think she took most of it in the shoulder, sort of playing dead. The gunner was still firing at the girl from above, so she ran for it and flagged down a passerby, who upon picking her up was also fired upon. I'm pretty sure they caught that dude. Around the same time, a college student sexually assaulted his ex or something then killed her by slamming her head into the wall over and over. There was at least one other mysterious sexual attack I don't quite remember, but I moved away in 2010 and didn't hear the end of it. Later, I think in 2012 or 2013, there was another attempted or successful kidnapping, didn't have all the details, at a nearby gas station, and they caught the dude on camera, and he was apprehended. All of these cases were rumored to be linked to the Morgan Harrington murder, but I have no clue if they actually were as far as I know, the person or persons responsible for her abduction, murder and likely rape are still at large. Separate, but worth mention, in 2009 ish, not too far off from the above mentioned murder, a group of college kids were doing some kind of project in a posted hunting area, presumably by mistake, and were shot at by a hunter. At least one of them was killed. I don't remember the details, but I do remember it was classified as an accident. It's a decent town but some faked up shit happens in and around it. City of Powkeepsie Police Officer Gary Coffey started as missing persons, now a 26 year old unsolved homicide point a local prostitute slash CI accused him of sexual assault. He disappeared shortly after. He was last seen alive running, in uniform, possibly chasing her. His body was found a few days later in the Hudson River. As I recall coroner said it was murder, not suicide point the prostitute was murdered shortly after, strangled. The prevailing theory seems to be Officer Coffee committed suicide rather face the sexual assault charges, coroner said murder to protect Coffee's legacy and pension, and, hey, hookers get killed all the time. Am I right? No one has ever been charged in either crime point a few years later serial killer Kendall Stinky Francois got arrested and charged with the murder of eight prostitutes in Powkeepsie, some who frequented the same cruising spots as the prostitute in the coffee case. At the time there was some talk of a connection, but nothing ever came of it point there have been some half-hearted attempts to link both coffee and Francois to Albert Fentris, popular middle school teacher, serial child molester sadist, murderer, and cannibal. This is more a topic of conversation slash polar game kind of thing as opposed to a real investigation. As far as I know point tldr, power keepsy. Come for our impossible to spell slash pronounce name. Stay for our weird and creepy murdery history point edit, typo and clarity. A little late to the party, but the disappearance of Kristen Smart is scary more because it's local than anything else. Basically, Kristen was found drunk on someone's lawn after a party. Kristen attended Cal Poly and was found by two other students, a man and a woman, and they decided to walk her to her dorm. Later they are joined by a third student, Paul Flores. Eventually, the first man leaves it to the other two students because he lived off campus. And the woman leaves it to Paul because his dorm was closer to Kristen's and her own point Paul says he walked Kristen as far as his own dorm and decided she could walk the rest of the way by herself point. That was the last time anyone saw her alive and it's an open and active case by the St. Louis Obispo Sheriff's Department. The disappearance happened in 1996. Kristen Smart was legally declared dead in 2002. As recently as last year the sheriff and the FBI did a search for her body near the campus and did recover some bone fragments. However they have yet to determine what kind of bones they are. Point the Flores family was sued by the Smart family the lawsuit dropped eventually. However, locally it's gotten to the point where a lot of people just assume Paul Flores is responsible. I had jury duty a month ago, and one of the would-be jurors wanted to point out he had rented a room from the Floors family in the past, and knew Paul Floors. The judge said, are you talking about the Floors family from the smart case? 
there has never been any charges brought against Paul Flaws, so I cannot see why it should affect your ability to be fair in this case. The smarts attorney believes Paul did it and claims he can make it look pretty bad for Paul. Their attorney also had a recorded deposition with Paul where he refused to talk about the disappearance and answered every time citing his Fifth Amendment rights. Almost 20 years ago, a 12-year-old girl went missing on her way to my high school one morning. Her disappearance was not reported to police for about 10 hours because the school believed she was probably sick at home while her family thought she was at school. Mannequins of the girl's likeness and in our school uniform were put up at railway stations she might have used and in shopping areas. Assemblies were held, asking any of us who may have known her or anyone she might be with to let the police or a teacher know they were working under the assumption that she had run away with a boyfriend or something. Media were camped outside the school gates for a week as the search went on. We had to be escorted out by staff in the afternoons. Eventually it became more likely that she hadn't run away and probably wasn't going to be coming back alive. Most people I knew assumed abduction point then they found CCTV of her walking near her home towards the railway station. She passed one camera and should have passed a second camera a few minutes later, but never did. She never made it to the station, and a shadowy figure was seen a few strides behind her, who also never appeared on the second camera. But there were no solid leads, though some people were questioned over it. Eventually the media interest died down, and things went on. My class graduated two years later, we were five years above her. The missing persons file would be occasionally mentioned somewhere, or I'd randomly recall her name and search for any news update online. Point at the end of last year, a man went to police to make statements about his family being killed, which were inaccurate, the people he named were alive. He stated it was retaliation for having murdered the schoolgirl all those years ago. Finally they knew what happened to her and had the person seen on the CCTV point he has apparently been assisting the investigation. He told them she was to be held for ransom, but something went wrong, and on the same day he took her, he killed her. He cannot remember where the body is, or maybe just doesn't want to say. Since the day the news of the arrest broke, there has not been anything else reported about the case. Not sure if the body has been found since point this person had been questioned and was a suspect in the original investigation, but they didn't have enough to get him. He had since moved and changed his name point will be interesting to see how it plays out. This wasn't an actual abduction, but I was a missing person for a few weeks. Could have very much turned out for the worst, though point I was dating a man 11 years my senior. He had many red flags but love. I was 22 at the time and living with my dad. When my dad found out my then boyfriend, now ex, was 33, he gave me the ultimatum of breaking up or moving out. Since my dad was a narcissist most of my life and didn't stop until this happened, I moved in with my boyfriend. It should be noted that my dad also threatened to disconnect my phone, a bluff. I believed him and kept it off because I figured it didn't work anymore. Point I'm there for a few weeks. No one has contacted me or my boyfriend. I had no idea anyone was looking for me. Turns out, all of my friends were contacted by my dad and other family. They even hired a private investigator because they thought I might have been sold to a set ring. They didn't know his last name, but found someone that was eerily similar, with a different last name. I'm not sure if he was ever contacted. Point my ex was abusive. Physically, emotionally, verbally. I was isolated. Nobody knew how to contact him. He was also probably undiagnosed with a psychotic illness one of my friends was hanging out at one of my ex's common hangouts and saw a friend of his. He asked if he had seen me. He said that he had and that I was at my ex's place. He called my ex and told him to ask me to call my family. I did and they all started crying point a prior ex called me that night while the ex I was staying with was in the room. He was furious and threw my phone in the toilet. He also kept my phone from me after the fact. Probably to destroy any evidence that he may have kidnapped me. He drove me home the next day and I never intentionally saw him again. Point I ran into him within the past year. He's gained a considerable amount of weight since then. Not sure if he's been mentally evaluated. I just hope he doesn't do this to anyone else as I didn't go to the police. 
I'm a search and rescue member out of Virginia and worked on a case that still causes head scratches from the most experienced investigators Eric Grady Smith was an experienced outdoors person and hunter. He worked as a foreman for Console Coal Company and was greatly admired by his peers and coworkers. He was extremely strict with following safety protocol and had no enemies. I thought he was real safety conscious, said Bob Brewster, 63, who knew and worked with Smith for years. He always had a good attitude. 1. Operation Smith worked on earned him a commendation after going a year without a single accident or incident, hunting, and his family are his two passions, said longtime friend and co-worker Danny Quessenberry point on the early morning of November 8, 2013, Smith told his wife that he was going hunting on their property in Cedar Bluff, Virginia, and that he would return soon. Armed with a Thompson Center .50 caliber muzzle-loading gun, he set out into his yard on land that he was extremely familiar with in an area he was equally familiar with. Point Eric Smith never returned, and after extensive searches for him, no trace of him was ever found. No clue, no tracks, not even a scent for the search dogs to pick up on. Nothing. Whatever happened to him remains a mystery. It was as if he just vanished quite literally. No motive for foul play could be found, as he had no enemies and always had a friendly disposition. There was no indication that he would abandon his family point so what happened? Family and friends remain hopeful, but the case remains unsolved. Creepy as in monstrous rather than spooky. An example of when you'd almost certainly rather not know the truth. Albert Fish letter to mother of children he abducted and ate. Very not safe slash suitable for work my dear Mrs. Bud. In 1894 a friend of mine shipped as a deck hand on the steamer Tacoma. Captain. John Davis. They sailed from San Francisco for Hong Kong China. On arriving there he and two others went ashore and got drunk. When they returned the boat was gone. At that time there was famine in China. One meat of any kind was from $1 to $3 a pound. So great was the suffering among the very poor that all children under 12 were sold for food in order to keep others from starving. To a boy or girl under 14 was not safe in the street. You could go in any shop and ask for steak, chops, or stew meat. Part of the naked body of a boy or girl would be brought out and just what you wanted cut from it. A boy or girl's behind which is the sweetest part of the body and sold as veal cutlet brought the highest price point John stayed there so long he acquired a taste for human flesh. On his return to NY he stole two boys 17111. Took them to his home stripped them naked tied them in a closet. Then burned everything they had on. Several times every day and night he spanked them, tortured them, to make their meat good and tender. First he killed the 11 year old boy because he had the fattest as and of course the most meat on it. Every part of his body was cooked and eaten except the head, bones and guts. He was roasted in the oven, all of his ass, boiled, broiled, fried, and stewed. The little boy was next, went the same way. At that time, I was living at 490 100 street, near, right side. He told me so often how good human flesh was I made up my mind to taste it. On Sunday June the 3 minus 1928 I called on you at 406 W15 Saint brought you pot cheese, strawberries. We had lunch. Grace sat in my lap and kissed me. I made up my mind to eat her on the pretense of taking her to a party. You said yes she could go. I took her to an empty house in Westchester I had already picked out. When we got there, I told her to remain outside. She picked wild flowers. I went upstairs and stripped all my clothes off. I knew if I did not I would get her blood on them point when all was ready I went to the window and called her. Then I hid in a closet until she was in the room. When she saw me all naked she began to cry and tried to run down the stairs. I grabbed her and she said she would tell her mama. First I stripped her naked. How she did kick, bite and scratch. I choked her to death, then cut her in small pieces so I could take my meat to my rooms. Cook and eat it. How sweet and tender her little as was roasted in the oven. It took me 9 days to eat her entire body. I did not fack her though I could have had I wished. She died a virgin. Not a person, but a dog and I think you'll understand when you hear it point. When I was a little boy, my chihuahua disappeared. 
Now this was bound to happen sooner or later because she was bad about running off down the street and I used to have to chase after her all the time and because we never could get her to wear a collar. So I always knew if she ran off and someone found her without a collar, that could be it, especially since a pure breed chihuahua was expensive back then and very popular, so we had to worry about dog thieves anyways, so she goes missing. I don't remember the details of how it started, but probably the typical took her out to pee, turned my back two seconds, and she sprints off, sometimes even ducking behind houses, so I can't see her. This same basic thing had happened many times with many close calls, but we always found her pretty quick, or she would come running back out of nowhere, but this time she just was nowhere to be found, and wasn't coming, no matter how many times we called. My mom takes us around in her car to look for her. We call my dad who lived a mile down the street, because my parents were divorced, and he comes and helps us look too we drove around for hours with no luck point the majority of the time I had been riding with mom, but after dad showed up I rode with him. At this point we had checked every inch of my neighborhood, so dad said we should check other nearby neighborhoods. It wasn't long before we were checking his neighborhood. At some point soon we got close to his house, which is 1.2 miles away from my mom's house, and as we drove by I see my dog standing at the bottom of his driveway and she immediately starts walking toward us, I absolutely couldn't believe it. My sweet baby had walked over a mile to my dad's house. It had been hours since she went missing, so she had more than enough time to get there, but it was still crazy. Especially since she had only visited there maybe two or three times at the most. I figured she had really missed my dad and had set out to see him, I counted my blessings and was so thankful my dog was okay that I never gave it a second thought point years later, after my dad had died, I was reminiscing about this story and how crazy my dog was for walking 1.2 miles to see my dad when suddenly mom said. Do you really think she did? Do you think she walked over a mile across the main road? and found your dad's house despite only being there two or three times, if that, I, was puzzled by the question. Well yeah, of course she did. She was there. That's where we found her. I was with dad when we found her. No. Sweetie, mom said I'm not asking whether or not you think she was there. I know she was. I'm asking whether or not you think she walked there. I was still confused. Well she didn't fly. What are you saying, let? Me spell this out, she said your dad, and I had a very rough divorce and he hated me afterwards. That's not news to you. He would have done lots of different things to spite me and to make himself look good. And basically let me put it like this. Don't you think it's a hell of a coincidence that your dad happened to think to drive by his house with you over a mile away and your dog was standing in the driveway in his driveway? I was in my 20s at this point, but the concept still blew my mind she continued I'm not saying I know anything for sure. He never admitted it, but I believe your dad kidnapped that dog and made sure you were in the car, so he would be the hero when he found it. Terra Calico. She was a 19 year old girl from New Mexico. She disappeared while on a daily bike ride. Her mother used to join her, but had stopped doing so after she got the feeling that a motorist was stalking them. When her daughter didn't return one day as expected, she called the police and started checking her bike route. Found a piece of her Walkman and a cassette, which her mother believes she threw herself to mark her trail. What makes it creepy is this picture, which was found around six months later in a parking lot of a convenience store in Florida. Her mother believes it's her pointy woman who found the photo said that it was in a parking space where a white windowless Toyota cargo van had been parked when she arrived at the store. She said that the van was being driven by a man with a mustache believed to be in his 30s. Police set up roadblocks to intercept the vehicle, but the man has never been identified. Furthermore, 20 years later, Florida police received two letters postmarked from Albuquerque, New Mexico, 20 years after the Polaroid photo was found and shared by the media, pictures of a boy were sent to the Port St. Joe police chief, David Barnes. He received two letters, postmarked June 10th and August 10th, 2009, from Albuquerque, New Mexico. One letter contained a photo, printed on copy paper, of a young boy with sandy brown hair. Someone had drawn a black band in ink on the photo over the boy's mouth as if it were covered in tape as in the 1989 picture. 
the second letter contained an original image of the boy. On August 12, the Sto newspaper in Port St. Joe received a third letter, also postmarked in Albuquerque on August 10, and depicting the same image of a boy with black marker drawn over his mouth. The boy has not been confirmed to be the same one as in the previous photo. Two other Polaroid photographs, possibly of Calico, have surfaced over the years, but they have yet to be released to the public. The first was found near a construction site in Montecito, California, and is a blurry photo of a girl's face with tape covering her mouth and light blue striped fabric behind her, similar to that on the pillow in the Toyota van photo. It was taken on film that was not available until June 1989. The second shows a woman loosely bound in gauze, her eyes covered with more gauze and large black framed glasses, with a male passenger beside her on an Amtrak train. The film used was not available until February 1990. This one creeps me out because it happened so close to where my uncle used to live, in Belen, New Mexico. I think that the kid from Breaking Bad is doing a documentary about it. Point this girl, Terra Calico, was abducted from the side of the road, bicycling point well, just to quote a little bit from the crime feed. You can read the rest over there. On September 20th, 1988, 19 year old Terra Calico was in a great even expansive mood as she pedaled away from home on a pink huffy mountain bike while listening to a cassette tape of Boston on her Sony Walkman. It was 9.30 a.m. and the fall weather made it a perfect morning to get some fresh air and exercise. She was out on a 17-mile cycling trek, planning to circle railroad tracks and the Rio community's golf course before returning to her parents' home in Belen, New Mexico. She had a tennis date at noon with her boyfriend, yet it would be the last time her family would see Terra. Point Terra talked to her mother, Patty Dole, before leaving, and playfully said, if you don't hear from me by noon, come look for me. When noon passed, and Terra failed to return home, Patty felt a bit anxious, but hoped her daughter was simply running a bit behind schedule point to ease her worries, Patty drove around the area. She headed south on NM 47, and circled around Rio communities, but saw no sign of terror. Feeling a twinge of panic, Patty slowed down her car down to a creep, and edged toward the ditches. A lump rose in her throat when she saw a Boston cassette tape lying on the shoulder of the rugged street point Patty immediately called the police and so began an exhaustive search for Tara, a successful college student at University of New Mexico at Valencia, um. According to family and friends, there was no reason that Tara would simply vanish without telling anyone. Patty suspected foul play and thought her daughter dropped the Boston tape purposely to leave a clue. The problem. However, was that Tara was an adult, and despite her family and friends telling authorities she wouldn't run away, police said there's nothing they could do. That all changed when they spotted fragments of a broken Sony Walkman on the side of the road, and a pink huffy bike thrown into a ditch, close to a secluded campground around 20 miles from Tara's home. A young woman in a town adjacent to mine went missing in, Ike, 1994, assumed to be kidnapped. There were tribute signs at the fire department. It was believed she was kidnapped from the local gas station because she was discovered to be a drug informant. They convicted a guy for it and he spent over 20 years in prison and has been trying to plead his case for about 10 point just recently new evidence has been found and everyone here thinks he's innocent and a new suspect and others tied to said suspect was unearthed. They found possible murder weapons in attics, no DNA so no case, had plenty of theories of how she was kidnapped and taken to the Canadian border which is what most people believe. Well, this new suspect would turn up to my 24 over 7 diner at night and stalk the news online to see what heat he was being put under. He'd tell us he's innocent and is just looking because he thought it was funny. We called him Creepy Mike because he was a rough looking dude, creeped us all out. Eventually he never came back, and we found out he'd been convicted prior of abducting girls in another state, only to be caught point a year or so later. We hear of, gossip mostly, but small town people know everyone so who knows, the missing girl's remains possibly being buried in a house in my hometown by the new suspect and his cronies. This was my ex's house. My ex came back from uni, and started hanging out with my friends more very recently. What he told me really chilled me to the bone point, since he was gone to university out of state he didn't hear of any of the new findings, 
he told us drunkenly one night that he opened the basement door at his parents' house while staying there after hearing voices. He said he saw the missing girl crawling up the basement steps begging for help. Obviously it was a hallucination or something. He has those, but since he hadn't been in the loop it really freaked us out, since it was at the house she was supposedly stashed at. He said it out of the blue, and we never mentioned the case beforehand. Still creeps me out. Tarkington, Texas being that we lived in the country, small town area, and neighbors were few and far to come by, you could imagine that my family and I were thrilled that decent family moved next door. A woman, her teenage son and her husband, stepfather of the son. We became quite close with them, we would join each other for meals, and I would regularly house it while they went on trips and vacations. Fast forward a few years later. My parents are divorcing, and we are all moving out of town. Soon after, the couple next door separates. Edwin goes missing. Stepson and his newlywed wife see the man's vehicle not too far from the house, down by the vet's office. Keys and phone left inside. Stepson doesn't think much of it, because Edwin had been spying on his mom since the separation. No one but the stepdaughter, wife's daughter, bothers to report him missing after several days of the vehicle is still in the same spot. Eventually there's a search for him, nothing is found. Police search their property. Ashes are found. Ashes turn out to animal. Rumors of the wife having an affair begin to stir. And then the case goes cold point several more men went missing months after Edwin. Vehicles parked off the side of the road. Phone and keys left. No traces. From to time to time I pass by my old house and see their house too. She's still living there, by herself. Honestly, to this day I believe she had something to do with his disappearance. Multiple times she had joked about wishing he was dead or would just leave. Never mentioned abuse, but they would fight, but no more than my own parents did at that time. I don't know, something about her rubbed me the wrong way, 